Okay, well, there we are. Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, hope everybody's going well. Uh, welcome uh, to today's RWM and Let's Recycle Live digital focus webinar. Um, today, we'll be hosting a panel discussion uh, looking at how Virador and Suez use AI to improve their sorting efficient efficiency and uh, and what they learned in the process. Um, so before we kick off, really, I'd just like to thank our partners on today's webinar, uh, Grey Parrot. Grey Parrot's team was founded by experienced entrepreneurs and AI experts uh, who built and scaled vision systems before at Blipper, a tech company listed three years in a row in CNBC's list of most disruptive companies in the world. Um, Grey Parrot's AI recognition system uh, is now deployed globally uh, in over 35 facilities across 10 countries and, uh, and around 60% of waste management companies in Europe use their technology. Um, this includes major waste companies in the UK, uh, including, of course, two you'll be hearing from today, uh, Burador and Suez. Um, so before we kick off with everything, um, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, the session will be recorded uh, for on-demand access afterwards. Um, and it'd be, hand it'd be great to get some questions throughout the panel discussion, um, which we will turn to at the end. Um, to leave a question, uh, just hover at the bottom of the screen and a Q&A icon will, will appear. Um, and if you want to sort of aim that as, uh, at a specific panelist, um, just let us know, let us know and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give it to them. Um, so I'd like now to, to introduce our panelists um, for today. Um, from Viridor, uh, we have Miguel Rosa, who's a technical manager for Polymers. Uh, he has nearly 20 years experience in recycling and plastics manufacturing and has responsibility for ensuring that the existing and new plants are fit to deliver best in class polymers. And um, before joining Viridor, uh, McGraw worked for several recycling companies producing polymers, including RPET, Food Grade, RHDPE, Food Grade, and PP, and also plant builders and equipment suppliers. Um, also, we have uh, from Suez Recycling and Recovery, Mr. Fer Azimi, uh, a processing engineer at the Lander Street Res Resource Recovery Center. Uh, in his role, he identifies opportunities uh, to apply learnings from his engineering degree uh, to improve the performance of the facility. Uh, he's currently a process engineer on the technical development team. Uh, so he helps the plants across the country to optimize and improve their processes eliminate waste and reduce process inefficiencies. And finally, representing Grey Parrot is Steve Almond, uh, a chartered waste manager and head of partnerships. He has more than 30 years experience uh, and was previously with Steinert and Tomra in recycling systems specializing in MRFs. Uh, he is highly experienced, <coughs> excuse me, in capital equipment with extensive knowledge of optical sensors, AI robots and technology. Um, so before we kick off uh, with the panel discussion, uh, Steve's going to share a brief insight into Grey Parrot's technology um, to set the scene uh, before we kick off. Um, so Steve, I will pass to you and uh, and then we'll begin. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, um, welcome, everybody. And thank you very much for, for attending today. I can see we've got a massive audience, which um, I guess is not really surprising when we, we, we see that AI potentially is the next big thing since the advent of uh, NIR sort of 15 plus years ago. So um, exciting, exciting time. So before we go into the main panel discussion, I'm just going to share a few slides and give you a nice overview, a short overview of uh, Grey Parrot and, and our product. Okay, so as Josh has alluded to, we've um, already talking to a lot of the leading waste management companies across the globe. We've been working behind the scenes uh, for the first years really gathering data and and we're, you can see here we're approaching 21 billion items reviewed every every year. So we're really building a strong database um, um, of our products. So what is it we actually are offering? Well, it's a system really. So it's it's going to give us a analytical live data. And in this system, we've got a number of different parts. We have the hardware, the software itself. We have the uh, APIs, which is the what we call application programming interface, and uh, then the dashboard. So let's kick off with the software. 
So we've been gathering images, as I said, for several years and building our AI model. And this is really to replicate the, the human eye that the AI has been used for, but of course, to a much better level. I mean, we can, we can see very small items, overlapping items, at high speed, three meters per second on, on belt speeds. So we're able to provide accuracy levels of over 98% on all materials in, in composition analysis. And perhaps even more importantly, we've been able to convert that information to, to mass or weight, of course, which is what the industry works to. So that's the, a real key thing we're working on. And we're already accurate across all materials of over 90% uh, on mass estimation. And in some items like um, containers, plastics were as high as 97%. So just, just jump into the different software systems that we, 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 we have. We, the main focus has been on materials and we've been gathering a whole list of, uh, of categories and we're up to nearly 70 different types of, of waste in the packaging stream. Uh, that includes, you know, things like we've got all the 30 different types of plastics with pots, tubs and trays and bottles. We've got about 13 different grades of, new, of paper in there and fiber and, and, and a similar listing of a dozen plus of, of flexible um, plastics as well. So ever increasing. And, and we're also moving into C&D, waste electronics and scrap metal in the coming, uh, coming months. Next thing is the product. So this is where we're looking at really more difficult, challenging parts of items that are difficult to, for the human being to see, crumpled items, uh, and other things like food grade, non-food grade, which of course is very important to, uh, to Miguel and his, um, and his polymer recycling. Uh, and the last part is the brand side. So this is where we, we're kind of focusing on EPR in the, in the future part, really, which is interesting where the, the brands are really looking to uh, Take ownership and you know be part of the, the new way that that the you know the whole system is going to be paid for, and they want to know what's going on with the waste and how and the cyclability of it. So we're already building an SKUs effectively of different products, different brands. Uh, we've up to about a thousand already, and we're aiming to get to ten thousand in the coming months uh, to build that uh, that new data set. Also, onto the hardware itself, you can see we've got a, a small grey box which is very retrofitable. We say plug and play. Uh, it's single phase, it's less than 25 kilograms. It will sit and measure material across the whole range of uh, belt widths right up to 2.83 meters wide. And it's just a camera, a graphic processor unit and an LED. So just single phase power, just needs an internet connection. So it's very simple, low cost system to deploy. And you can see some examples here of the uh, these are pics taken on uh, sewers and viridal locations. On to the next part. This is uh, the, the dashboard, which is built by us, um, designed for the customer's needs. And it um, can be uploaded to it, as many stakeholders as required in, in the business and provides all sorts of a range of, uh, of different features and benefits depending on who wants what information. But just very, very quick overview. You can see you've got a, a camera live on there. We can, all the categories I mentioned, the 70 categories of material are uploaded, and you can pick and choose how many of those you want to use, a high level, just a couple, or a little deep dive into every single category. And you can build a whole variety of recipes, if you like, in, in, the, in the mix. And you can, we can work with mass, item count, and even value. So we can actually put the, the pounds or the euros in there and give you value. Um, the data can be viewed live, and then there's historic data as well. So you can zoom right into a minute and then write out a three months worth of data. And a couple of interesting features, we have this target level where you can set a threshold to monitor the quality of, of products and other things too. And then finally, we have uh, our API, which is a software API in this case. So we can export the data via a token straight to your third party software system. Or you could just use the CSV files and export um, you know, Excel spreadsheets. Okay, so this is our general overview showing some of the applications we're working on. And this is, you know, I always relate this to chapters in a book. And, you know, the more chapters you read, the better you, you understand the ending. And, and this is no different in, in a waste recycling plant um, in terms of camera deployments and gathering data. And, and just to 
if you look at some of the things we've been doing with these with these guys, we've been from applications, we've been measuring the infeed, um, we've been looking at the residual lines, we've been looking at the quality of the materials going into the bunkers, we've been looking at the manual sampling part, which is a key thing under the code of practice, where we're trying to speed that process up from you know laborious manual sampling, couple of people you know doing samples, and we, we can uh, do that process in a few seconds. And then in the quality control cabins, we're using again APIs into hardware this time through robotics. We can do um, workout pick plates as well, which we've been doing for sewers, and, and they can decide the, 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 the performance of, of manual pickers uh, and then review whether uh, robotics is um, a next step. So a whole range of interesting features. Other APIs, we're looking at uh, assisting uh, optical sources and working with and trying to improve uh, you know, quality in that measure. We can do APIs into balers and provide the digital purity stamp uh, to accompany any tracking through an RFID tag system. So there's a whole range of very interesting uh, applications. That's a very quick overview. And final slide, again, just looking at the, the cross section of uh, stakeholders interested in, in this type of product. You know, obviously the, pro, the, the, the MRFs and the weed processors, we're talking to the waste traders in terms of, you know, backtracking uh, quality. The equipment manufacturers in, in the APIs, the robots, the opticals, and the bailers, and, and through PLCs, big plant integrators and plant builders who are very interested in, in, in monitoring the flows of waste, you know, the size and the 2D and the 3D, different sizes, you know, and we see the future in plugging into SCADA systems and have dynamic control. This is where we'd, lo we'd love to be in the, in the near future. And it's because it's all doable now. It's just a matter of, you know, design. And then final category is the product. Um, and uh, for the regulators on the more the EPR side. So that's my very quick overview. Thank you for that. I'll hand you back over to Josh. Thank you, Steve. Uh, much appreciated. I think that was really interesting to see the, the insight there. Um, I think that the best way to perhaps kick things off, uh, perhaps, uh, Miguel, you could start with this, which is, can you share insights into your journey with AI? Um, not necessarily just with Grey gray Parrot, but but overall, I think for a lot of people, it seems like a really distant, faraway thing, but obviously it's here and here and ready to go. So Miguel, could you um, share your insights into your journey with AI? Uh, <clears throat> so we've been um, we've been in recycling for uh, for many years, like I'm sure a lot of people on the call. Um, as Steve said, 15 years ago, we started, everybody started starting with, uh, with NIRs, which were the best technology at the time. Um, but uh, the requirements of what's needed to, to do now, they, they've changed. Um, unfortunately, the um, AI has come to, uh, to, to bridge the gap that we, um, we can't bridge with, uh, with the infrared sorting. So we can, as, as Steve's saying, uh, identify uh, food grade, again, non-food grade, uh, specific applications. We can look at an object and say, this was a margarine tub uh, or this was a, uh, a shower bottle. Uh, and that completely expands the range of what we can do in terms of sorting and in terms of compliance and in terms of uh, demonstrating what, what we're doing with our products. Brilliant, Mr. Can I bring you in on that as well? Yeah, um, so I think AI and waste industry, when I joined the waste industry, I saw there's lots of opportunities, a lot of uh, inefficiencies, and I think AI is there to kind of eliminate and improve the way we do things. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's sampling, if it's recognition, if it's data collection, uh, I think, yeah, AI in the waste industry mainly it's got a lot of opportunities. It just depends on how the, the business or the people in the business uh, utilize or uh, introduce AI in, into their processes. Uh, so I think it's, it's got a lot of uh, opportunity in the future it's just on how, how how do you go about it and how the technology uh, continuously advances because AI is essentially a uh, self-learning kind of system. Great. And, and perhaps tying quite nicely, if, if we could look at some of the the reasons why you decided to install the Grey Parrot system. So could you, could you first of all, Mustafa, perhaps give an overview of where you installed the Grey Parrot system and perhaps what, what made you decide, decide to do so? Um, so we, uh, at Suez, uh, at Orlando Street Murph, we 
uh, decided initially the program was to look at a potential uh, robotics uh, installation of an, a, a robot. Uh, but we, we decided to go with Grey Parrot and then installing one of the systems on our reject line just to see the material composition and the the volume of material. We could have gone the traditional way by just manual sampling, uh, but we decided to implement the system so we have the full visibility uh, and, and and make a decision, a commercial decision essentially. Uh, and the, yeah, the benefits will be uh, you, you, when you have accurate data, when you have uh, something where you can present to anyone in a way that's live uh, and it's factual data, it's a lot more easier to convince anyone than just using traditional sampling or assumptions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's... Good. I'm gonna go, perhaps bring you in on that as well about, about where you've installed Great Power and what, and what what made you decide to do so. Pretty much the same. Uh, we, we, we look in uh, two or three different fronts. So first, uh, MERS code of practice and analyzing material. Uh, the quantities we analyze are somewhat limited if you use uh, humans to do it. Um, second, more than the MERF code of practice as well, we want to uh, analyze the basket values of the materials coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be sure that we're getting what we're buying. Uh, so it really helps with transparency on uh, the materials coming in. Uh, at the same time, we are the end users of the polymers that we sort because we um, we then manufacture uh, PET, HDP, PP, uh, recycled polymers out of it. So we want to know exactly what we're producing in one plant to feed the other plant. Um, and last but not least, we, um, again, we used to, uh, in, in 20 years ago, uh, we look at the bale in the yard and say, yeah, that looks about right. Um, when we were like pure, pure waste management companies, uh, we then got to the point that we start going around with the uh, paper clipboard, clipboards. Uh, maybe we got to the point we're using tablets, but now what we're trying to get is uh, having intelligent plants that we um, we can actually get the plant to tell us, well, go and check something because maybe one of the NIR is not working correctly because the composition of your reject material um, is totally wrong. Um, and that, that's brilliant for us because it's, it just gives us more tools uh, to manage the business whether with the, with the information we get from it, really. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps I could bring bring you in here, Steve. You know, you mentioned before about 30 years of consulting in MERFs and, and how to make their processes more efficient. Um, what would you say are the, the sort of key challenges that, that they're facing in doing so? Um, yeah, I think um, in the simple terms, I think I see the challenges really being the variable um, and often unknown in-feed materials, the uh, rapidly increasing demand for recovery and quality targets and, and last not least the, the labor issues and just maybe if I can elaborate a little bit more on, on, on those um, when I first started in, in the waste industry this is before duty of care and landfill was at 90 percent and and recycling plants were just a manual process two or three tons an hour if you were lucky and pretty straightforward and simple and then of course all the new drivers start coming in rightly so from, you know, EU um, in terms of, you know, uh, landfill diversion, then we have the landfill tax. Then more recently, we've had um, national sword in terms of the impact on, you know, uh, on the fibres of uh, quality. And then, of course, the uh, tax on, on plastics. And to add to that, you know, the, the general public and the CO2, you know, sustainability groups really creating a lot of drive. And what's happening then, of course, we're under pressure to process all these materials. And it, we think back to the first left, the first line of MRFs we had, this under the PFI systems, you know, 2010, a lot of those were copied from European uh, plants or worldwide plants. So in the waste streams were different to ours, you know, and then often they were designed one year and they were not implemented for four or five years. So, and the waste streams had changed. So I think we've learned from then, as we've gone forward over the past few years, it's not just about a recycling plant, it's about, um, a waste processing factory and the, the F, you know, any factory producing goods has to know what comes in and what goes out and understand the middle bit. I think, you know, this is the issue where we've always had is not understanding the middle bit. You know, the, we know what's coming into a plant more or less mm -hmm. in terms of its weight, but not what's in it. 
and we don't understand where it goes to and how it's how the, the process is done. And I think um, you know data can hopefully help that um, mm -hmm. and um, you know help us understand and optimize the, the plants and make the you know the the upgrades and the new plants of the future uh, work in a better way. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps I have to bring back in <clears throat> Mr. Fern and McGraw. So we've spoken a lot about data, and I think we all know the importance of data, particularly with the legislation coming up. But uh, what data insights in particular um, did you find most valuable and, and why? Um, so, Miguel, could I perhaps begin with you on that one? Um, well, f first of all, for sure, the, the composition. And um, I like to think of uh, ourselves as manufacturers, as Steve is saying. Uh, so knowing what is going through your plant uh, and um, being able to make decisions based on that is really important. Um, in terms of regulations, um, you've also uh, probably seen that uh, there's new EU regulations that will probably be followed by the UK. Uh, for food grade, for instance, where you have to demonstrate uh, traceability of the materials, you need to uh, demonstrate the composition of the materials. Uh, and it's really, really important to us. So if you're manufacturing something and you want you know, want to know it's consistent, uh, it's really important to know that, uh, for instance, uh, talk about, for instance, probably properly, you know, we got a bottle and a tray and they got completely different uh, mechanical properties. It's really important to know the, those compositions of materials so then you know uh, what quality of material you're manufacturing out of it. Uh, and so can I bring you in on that? Perhaps, you know, what data insights did you find most valuable and, and why? Uh, I think, of course, as uh, Miguel mentioned, a material composition is key for us. That's what, what, what the whole idea was behind. But it was quite interesting to see the variation and the peaks and troughs throughout the day of different material uh, composition. So you, you and, and in a morning shift, you could have some set of material being at a really high level. And then eight hours down the line, you'll have a completely different setup for so that kind of aspect of it is quite interesting and depending on what you do in a MRF you could actually utilize your staff or your process differently if you start seeing patterns throughout the day uh, different customers if the customer uh, reducing the uh, what they're sending us and what we will get on our basket basket, uh, basket value so I think uh, the peaks and shafts was quite interesting and how uh, it could recognize if the belt was overwhelmed or there was no material on it. Uh, again, that's something we can uh, use uh, and make, uh, yeah, use it to decide on what we can do in the future. Oh, okay, it's interesting. So it sort of ties into a question here from, from Stephen Hodges. Uh, perhaps Steve, you'd be the best one to, to touch on this, but it, Stephen asked, to, to what extent are the Grey Parrot systems now integrated? with NIR cameras um, such that MRFs can now automatically be reprogrammed in real time, if you like, to, to improve recycling rates and improve quality of, of outputs. Uh, thank you. The, well, the idea of APIs for hardware, you know, it's a fairly recent thing in, 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 in the, pre, you know, it's months, not years. So we've already been working directly with the robotic arms, you know, with the stuff with ABB on Kawasaki and that, that's been done already. In terms of the APRs with NIR, it's a much bigger picture. You know, we're talking to all the major NIR manufacturers, uh, uh, you know, about how we can, you know, work, work together. And that's a sort of medium term uh, strategy. And and the similar thing with the with the Baylor companies, you know, we talk, we talk to all the major Baylor companies about how we can uh, use the digital purity stamp in with the RFID uh, tracking system. So it takes time, you know, to, to for these things to, to come together it's all it's all doable it's just a matter of you know stakeholders coming together and discussing it and helping the you know the likes of uh Suez and Viridor okay Brilliant. okay so then moving on um to the next thing there's another question chat which I'll come to um it's from uh Barrett part of my pronunciation um and it's a question uh from Mr Fan Miguel uh, and they asked uh, are there any areas of your operation that are still unmonitored and could do with being fed into your AI engine? Uh, um, absolutely. Um, we like, like we're deploying any new technology. Um, we uh, we went step by step uh, from the point that we've uh, we've installed the, the the systems 
um, uh, incrementally um, on an ideal world where money is no um, it, it's not a problem. Uh, we have it in every single conveyor, so we could analyze everything, every residue uh, to monitor what um, what every machine is doing. Uh, Obviously, we have to rationalize costs, and we have to uh, to do some. So there, there, there's some gaps that, of course, we want to aim up. Just, just to add on to that. Um, so we, as Miguel also mentioned, we started from the rear. So we start from the back end, as outputs of materials is a lot easier for the systems to recognize, and uh, and that's kind of where our interest is. Was uh, we starting to look into the in feed, and depending on the plant and how uh how your burden depth is on certain conveyors we've not really tested it on those areas just because you you have to understand how ai works and how the system works it can only see what it can see so if there's material underneath certain products you you'll struggle to get a accurate co a composition uh so we've not started it on the the lines where there's a, a big burden depth for uh mainly on the in feed lines but other than that everywhere else we've uh, mainly focused on the outputs mm -hmm. okay brilliant and then so again we've spoken a lot about waste composition data we know how important it is could you give a, an overview of, of how this impacts your your business operation if you like and perhaps any other benefits that you see or that you have seen so far um mr Fabi, you'd like to start with that one Yep. Sorry, what was that question again? It kind of lagged for me. Sorry, uh, how will waste composition data impact your business operations and what other benefits do you see? Um, I think the commercial decision can be made in the future. Uh, if, if we have a uh, data throughout the day we can recognize what we're sending to customers uh we can uh decide who we want to keep who do we want to not keep and uh who do we need to send the products to so i think the main side of things is the commercial and operational decisions is you can start being more proactive than reactive and start planning uh the way you would like to run your operations and it's just becoming a more uh, intelligent MRF essentially in the future if we start introducing AI and make use of it to the uh, to the right standard. I think I'll I'll second that and look um, Steve's been around for long enough and I asked him a few times um, everybody in the recycling industry has done a million trials uh, having these systems in is like having a 24-7 uh, trial system Mm -hmm. So we can gather all the data and then as a management team, being ourselves or um, senior leadership, uh, we can do, look at that data and um, and make really good decisions based on that. So, um, it's just that, that visibility, that 24-7, you can know what's happened. You know, material that arrives from a different geographical area, material from a different supplier, different times of the year where the composition of the materials change, uh, which is something that you see in the summer, you see in the winter material changes it's so 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 important to understand um what you're getting in your business how, how to manage the best way possible mm -hmm. and then so i suppose the question perhaps for steve but maybe mr from can come in if they'd like to um from an anonymous attendee uh, they asked does the data gather so far feedback into sorry excuse me does the data gathered so far feedback into government databases and does it get any funding from the government in the uk um, it's it's feeding back into our own um, AI model, which is a, a library, effectively, which we're sharing throughout the world, so everybody benefits from the from the system. You know, in terms of data, we can provide data to anybody. So, you know, we're talking to people like DEFRA about how we can present data in, in the right way uh, through them. But um, so it's all it's all doable. We have the technology to export data into anybody else's system. Um, we're currently not doing that with the government now, but it's all it's all doable for sure. Uh, and Mr. Fum, we've got, does, does the data gathered and enable you to to feed back into 
you know, government figures that might be needed for clients or, or, or whatever. Is, is that able to be done? We, in, we're not feeding it to, uh, to anyone at the moment. We keep it all for ourselves. Um, but for sure, there's a big potential for that in the future, being um, regulatory, if you're talking about uh, the food standards agency. And if you want to demonstrate that the uh, material complies with the, the required rules, um, it could be in, in, in a number of ways. I think um, there's probably a little bit of work to do in terms of standardizing the, the different technology, technologies um, and having a, a platform that everybody can report the data the same way. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably a conversation, Steve will tell you that's probably a conversation for next year, uh, getting everybody around the table and, you know, how do we standardize how everybody works and how everybody's data is compatible with one another? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the moment, we, we've we got the traditional MERF code of practice, sampling inbound and outbound, and uh, that's very manual and, uh, manually driven. And um, the ideal world is... Uh, replacing the so we submit every quarter to the EA uh, our inbounds and outputs uh, compositions and volumes whereas if you start introducing AI and you can capture all this information on your outputs uh, potentially in your inputs but I think there's some work needed to be done uh, we could yeah channel it into a database and then we could share it with the EA without any issues uh, I think they would probably trust that more than uh, our standard MERF code of uh, sampling, which is being done uh, day to day. So yeah, it's, it can be done. Mm. I know from, from my point of view, it's quite exciting. So I must admit, trying to put a story together on data using waste data flow uh, is challenging for myself and I don't know uh, how to work it all the time. So it would be, would be great uh, from a selfish point of view. Um, but then moving on. Um, so question here from Richard Hudson, uh, he touched upon, um, you know, he said the advances in AI recognition, AI recognition have been fantastic. Um, on the on more of the hardware front, um, do you, does the panel, I suppose, think you know robotic robotic picking arms are the way forward to to remove what the AI can detect, or are there other technologies in development to to supplement this, or, or pickers, or or, or how, how do you think is the best way to supplement this? Do I start? Yep. Uh, I mean, look, there's always a place for robots. You know, there's always that at the end of the plant where you've got multiple picks into multiple shoots. You know, optical sorting can't do that. Mm -hmm. But you know, my, with my optical sorting hat on, you know, there's thousands of machines out there doing a fantastic job. And with a little bit of vision on top, you know, we can just tweak that recovery, tweak that purity. And I think that's where the big potential is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Look, uh, as Steve says, there's a, a, a gamut of different companies doing different things. And I don't think there is one machine in the market that is right for all applications. Uh, so if, for instance, if you want to pick up really uh, heavy objects, uh, you need to look at a, a different set, a sort of set of mechanics. If you want to do uh, loads of picks at high speed and volumes, you need something uh, different. Um, I think the, the brilliant is that... Um, the recognition technology is there um, and uh, with, with the advances on computing power, there will be more and more that will be able to identify. Uh, and then how, how do we sort the mechanics? There's, there's plenty of people that do the mechanics really well, to be honest. Great. Okay, brilliant. So moving on then, uh, looking more at sort of on the ground uh, uh, development of it. Um, question from Maguro. Um, I think you touched upon it earlier, but perhaps good to come back to it is, how do you see or do you even see the potential to scale up the use of AI at Virador, perhaps across the, the portfolio? Um, for sure. We, um, as a company, we don't just um, manufacture polymers or recycle plastics. We, we've got a fleet of uh, energy recovery facilities, for instance. Uh, there are applications um, where we can uh, analyze the, the, um, the materials that we receive. Um, so there's for sure um, lo loads of opportunities to um, to spread the technology to other places. And as as everything else that um, we're doing at the moment is information decisions, information decisions. Decision. If we gather that information, uh, we then can make the best decisions on what uh, you know whether what investing in, um, 
more technology for the plants or how we manage the, 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 the feedstocks. So information decisions. Can I ask you the same question there, Mustafa, is that how or do you see the potential to scale up the use of AI at uh, Suez? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think it depends on how and the applications you, you use the AI technology and, and uh, with sewage is, is, is ginormous in, in the UK, especially with plenty of MERFs, SRFs, any sort of processing plant that you can, where you have material and uh, it could be utilized. It, it doesn't just mean for recording data, you can reutilize it and certain other things, uh, giving you uh, your, your weight throughout the whole day. It can give you an estimation of your tonnage that went through the line, for example, as well. Uh, for your sampling, for the standard data collection, or for proposals for other plants. So I think once we are happy with the setup on a certain area, we it, it, it could be scaled up at every single site we've got, depending on what they need. Okay. Um, good question here just came in from uh, Megan. Perhaps I'll stick with you, Mr. and come to McGuire afterwards. Um, Megan asked, what, what are the obstacles, I think we touched on this before, but we'll come back to what are the obstacles or challenges in implementing the AI? And was the well, were the floor teams supporting this initi initiatives or rather seeing it as a threat to their jobs? I think that must be quite an interesting thing sort of on the ground. Um, so, so Mr. Fo, what were the obstacles and, and were the floor teams supportive of, of this? Um, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's a challenging wise it's not really it's just making making sure it's it's fit for purpose it's what exactly what do you want to achieve what are you looking for and implementing it in that area and that field uh, in terms of the shop floor the guides yes uh, i think one thing we need to keep in mind is it's not just about uh it's removing the wastage. We can upskill other people into different fields. If we start introducing AI and uh, it's it, all inefficient inefficiencies, we there's repetitive tasks where you could introduce the kind of system and it could eliminate that side of things. People could be redeployed in else and 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 in, in, in more suitable locations. I don't mean AI will immediately do that, but there is. Uh, I don't think it should be a threat. I think it should be just the way of the, the business, the waste industry should go forward. And we should be looking at how do we make it even more efficient by, if it's a Mondian task, if it's a very uh, admin related task, if you've got a system that does the job for you, then, then look at other opportunities. Because I've been in the, in the industry now for three and a half years. There's not a day which I don't see, oh, actually we can do this different. We can do this different. So continuous improvement is, is just enormous in, in the waste industry. So I think, Having this is is giving the it will start making the waste industry come to the similar levels of the automotive and all of the other manufacturing. When we're not there, I'm not trying to point that out, but it is that's where we need to be heading to. It's just uh, efficiency and improvement. I'm go up, yeah, I'll, Sorry. yeah I'll, I'll I'll second that and look the um, and a lot of the the jobs we can automate as well. Is jobs that as an industry, I'll, I'll speak for you, go around the and other people have the same feedback. It's different, difficult at the moment to recruit, and um, so it, it's jobs that we can automate. Um, we can still retain the people we've, we have and retain uh, retrain them, uh, and people can actually get better jobs, better jobs that uh, probably give, uh, put a little bit more money on the, on their pockets as well. Um, and do the, you know remove a little bit those jobs that you know are going to be really low paid jobs most of the cases, uh, which again difficult to recruit and really difficult to retain people as well. Yeah, so I suppose correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems similar to you know, when self service checkout scanners sort of came around the supermarkets and everyone said that it's going to be the death of you know supermarket workers, but it's, it hasn't really been, has it? Just move on to to other roles really. Um, so there's quite a lot of questions that have come in uh, more on the technical side of things. Um, so I might not want to get bogged down too much in the specifics, but you know, great power are around afterwards if, if anybody has any further questions um, to give to them. Uh, but I will, I will come around uh, to some of them. 
so one of them uh, was, again, it might be a bit, um, a bit crazy if you like, or is it? Perhaps you can shed some light, Steve. This is from Martin Everett. Um, he asks, uh, you know, I gather curbside sorting can generate better quality materials. He said, is there any prospect of AI being fitted to collection vehicles one day? Um, and you could then leave uh, any reject with the householder. Yeah, interesting question. And it's been asked in a quite a few times. Um, we have kind of explored it and I'm sure we can look further into it. But the issue I have, it's, it's about um, sensible deployments and getting accurate information. You know, you, you've got a lot of issues um, with vibration, dirt, dust, no internet connections. There's a whole host of stuff that makes it tricky. You know, sensors in bins is one thing, measuring, you know, how, how much is in it, right? you know, and, and working out when it's full. But actually, you know, a composition analysis is a whole new ball game. But, you know, it's on, it's on my wish list for sure. Brilliant. Um, just got a little nudge there that if uh, any unanswered questions, uh, the uh, email is contact at greyparrot.ai. Um, so send them over and one of the teams there will be uh, good to go. Uh, so before I come to, to more questions from the audience, uh, perhaps I could um, have a sort of question to the panel, I suppose, to, to round things off. Um, perhaps we'll start with Steve. Uh, a single piece of advice or practical advice on how to get people on board with a new technology and a new way of working. So have you seen any resistance and would, you know, what is your single bit of practical advice that you would give to people? I faced the same issue 15 years ago with optical sorters. It was like, how much is that? I'll stick with my pickers. Thank you very much. And now everybody has dozens of them. And it's the same with this tech. Try it. Play around with the dashboard like everybody's doing so far. Understand it. You know, learn what, what's what's available. And once you can do that, you can then understand what the guys have been saying, what, what the next levels and the capabilities of the other technology are. And, and McGraw, could I ask the same thing there? So a single bit of advice or on how you get people on board with new technology, even, even within the company or? Um, don't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. uh, people people uh, don't like change and disruption. Um, go and see, try it, uh, and we'll, we'll see the benefits. Um, uh, when, when Steve was in, uh, in a previous life, for instance, uh, with a bottle sorters, the costs were completely different as well. Um, the, the AI systems uh, and identification at the moment are uh, more affordable, um, but j just try. Don't 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 be afraid of um, what's going to to happen, because you're going to get a lot of benefits out of it. Mister, mm -hmm. can you uh, conclude on that one then? So, a single bit of practical advice on how to get people on board with the new technology. Yeah, similar as they mentioned. Just try it. Don't be scared. Uh, of course, find your application for you where you need it, what you need it for, and. Ask the questions, Ray Parrot, whoever, whoever else you're going to be thinking of using. Uh, with AI, I think it's just, just go and do it. Don't be afraid. Don't ask questions, whatever it's you're worried about. Ask him and make sure you've got this a, a plan ready to, to go ahead with it. That's mm. that's all I can say for that. Really? Okay, well, we'll come to some, we have about 10 minutes left. So we'll come to some more questions out here from the audience. Um, so some of them are quite technical, as I mentioned. I think we and Mr. Vick can come in uh, and help uh, as well. Uh, the first one came in from Gavin, uh, right at the end, right at the beginning, sorry, actually. Um, I think it's quite an interesting one and one that I've heard quite a lot, um, which is how does the Grey Parrot technology separate plastic packaging with sleeves that contain different polymers that are almost identical? Um, and Steve, perhaps you could bring that, bring yourself in on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is all linked to, to the whole principle of the technology. You know, we're able to use human vision to make the, you know, to distinguish these things. So if there's a visible marker of any size, any type, we can, we can do, we can distinguish, you know, so food grade, non-food grade between same polymer PET bottles and HG bottles and PP bottles is quite an easy job. You know, we've just done a project where we were doing, um, uh, washed containers and we were asked to look at what brands they were and we did a reasonably a pretty good job in identifying brands without labels just looking at shapes distinguishing 
reflections on the on the packaging. It's, it's amazing what we can achieve with the um, with the AI uh, vision. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go with the Viridos or plastics division. Uh, have there been any difficulties separating packaging with with sleeves with different polymers and things like that? Or um, so, same as Steve is saying because typically, if you're looking at um, the NAR signatures. Uh, it's almost that you are semi-blind, if you like. You can see the material types uh, and you can see some nuances and signatures between different materials, but it makes it more difficult. Uh, what we're doing, and yes, we're a bit far away, but we're replicating, a, or they, rep, they are replicating a human brain uh, that looks at shapes, that looks at uh, what else is on the bottle. Uh, so we're analyzing a lot more information that is not just um, you know a few points on an, uh, in the infrared signature. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, um, another one uh, came in uh, a bit earlier in the discussion was from uh, Martin, um, and he said the technology seems as if it's almost positive sorting. Um, so he said identifying and removing materials that are wanted. Uh, can a technology also do negative sorting, as he described it, and identify contaminants and reject items? Um, and he said, my experience is you need to expect virtually anything that people can get into a bin. <clears throat> so is it yeah, possible? I mean, one of our big applications is residual baselines, and uh, where we see not just you know the core recyclable products on there that have been missed, which of course is important to see, but everything else, you know, a battery, a face mask, textile, a training shoe, and all the rest of it. So all these things can be identified uh, and given you know more information, more data to build up the picture of you know what is not being processed. Mm -hmm. And again, one one for the panel really, but the one one question which pops up a lot whenever I've been at these sort of discussions before, which is we're obviously talking about household waste here. Is is it possible to have this technology on a sort of commercial and demolition sort of site or or sort of other sectors of the waste waste sector too? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're we're already deployed cameras in a number of C and D plants. Um to start building our data sets for those materials. You know, we, we realize that, that, for example, the inert materials, the concretes and the tarmacs and all this sort of stuff, the brick, uh, we can quite easily recognize those. The same with the wood grades, we can distinguish the, you know, the A-grade woods to the MDFs and the chipboards and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then the same thing we can apply with waste electronics, you know, chip, um, you know, chipboards and um, brass, copper, and, you know, and that kind of thing going into, uh, Car, car shredder residues where we've got more you know challenging things to look at aluminium and, and, and other things so this it's all doable it's just a matter of building the, the data sets and, and that's all on our, on our agenda for the next uh, 12 months mm -hmm. and this is a so uh, this is a one from an anonymous attendee um more for mr uh, mcguell uh, and they ask have you been analyzing the results of the data with the actual sampling that you still do manually um, and they added off that this relates to the wait times purity economic model that's still in place across Europe. <clears throat> um, I can go first. Um, yes, uh, not as much as we uh, we want to. Um, and then one of the things that I already spoke to Steve and um, uh, something that we we'll have to um, to do at some stage is being able to calibrate the the systems with known samples. Mm -hmm. um, because the, once you start getting uh, regulatory alignment for some particular um, data requirements we have, uh, there's got to be some you know, quality management system where you say, okay, I've put a sample of 100 kilos of this particular material. The, um, the, the human uh, said it was this composition. What does the machine say? The, the thing, no method you have for testing or analysis will be perfect. Uh, but if we consider the margin of error uh, of doing a test that might be, one can argue that slightly less, it could be less efficient than a, a well-trained picker, which is difficult to get. Uh, a well-trained picker is only going to take 20 kilos and do a, a sample that by definition is very exposed to variation and inaccuracy. When you actually do uh, 20, you know, total analysis, um, you might have some slight inaccuracies, but because you're testing a lot more, uh, that data by definition should be much more reliable because you're doing everything. So, mm -hmm. I, I, personally, I know where I want to be. Okay. 
So then again, probably a question here for the, for the entire panel. Uh, do you view that AI will replace NIR as the primary sorting identifying device or will they always have to work in partnership? Uh, whoever would like to is uh, welcome to jump in uh, on this one. Can we get the computing power, Steve? Um, no, look, I, I, um, I come from a computer background. I actually trained as a computer engineer, computer programmer. Um, if you think where we were 20 years ago that we didn't have a phone, uh, now we, we got mobile phones in our pockets that probably got more computing power than the first NIR sorter that we had 15 years ago. Uh, if you follow that trend of exp exponential computing capacity, where will we be in five or 10 years time? So I, th I think, you know, uh, we're looking at stuff with quant not, not very though, but, you know, quantum computing and all sorts of things that are exponentially increasing the, the, um, the computing power. So I think the sky is the limit, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, the future, you, you, you start becoming very, uh, especially with DRS and APR, uh, becoming very uh, critical with what grades of material need to be recycled and where we need to recycle it. So I think AI, I mean, when NIR is more about the material density and the composition, whereas with AI, it physically looks at the product and it will give you an accurate reading of what it is, if it's labeled, if it's non-labeled, food grade, non-food grade, which I think will be the next step, the next evolution for waste industries and how the, the, the government or the council want to go ahead with the, the collection and sorting but i think yeah it, it 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 just depends on how fast it can advance and how uh how they just maintain with the current situations yeah just to add from my side you know I was working working in nir and x-ray for, for many years and other sensor-based sorting it'll never replace but it's always going to be complementary that's mm -hmm. simple as that brilliant uh, another uh, probably time for another couple of questions here uh, one was again another one which pops up it came up quite a bit at the murph conference a while back was uh batteries um uh, seen a lot about fires and incidents there does this technology enable or can sort of to notify where batteries are and, and can it help take batteries out, out, out of the stream too perhaps miguel and uh, mr Collins. <clears throat> Don't get me started with batteries. I think uh, it'll be the same with Mustafa and everybody else. Uh, whether you can, um, whether you can do that or not, uh, I'll let uh, Steve answer that. But for sure, uh, batteries are the single biggest risk for us uh, on Mars. Uh, so it's a, a real problem that needs no pun intended, but a real problem that needs sorting. Yeah, perhaps if I could just add to that a bit more context. We've done a lot of work. Uh, naturally on, on battery detection, you know, there's a lot of fires in plants and, and you know, so that we, we can do that. It's relatively straightforward again, you know, lithium, different types of batteries, uh, we can recognize them and label them. The big issue, and like a lot of things, is the, the sorting, and uh, which is on the mechanical side and how these things are actually spotted in a difficult waste stream and how they're removed. Uh, it's all doable um, with the AI, the mechanical designs and, and the flow, you know, the belt widths and all the rest of it, it's all doable. It's just a, it's just a question of, you know, changing the way we do things. Fantastic. Okay, well, I think that brings us nicely uh, to the uh, 12 o'clock. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, everybody, first of all, for joining us. I uh, really appreciate um, coming along. I think it's been really interesting to hear some of those insights. As I said before, it really seems like a, uh, Thing that's far away or isn't here but it really is so a uh, big thank you for joining a uh, big thank you to uh, steve mcguire mustafa as well um and with that i'd like to sign off today's webinar um so yeah do keep in touch as mentioned earlier um for those questions i couldn't get around to uh do uh, email gray parrot um, and they'll be able to answer that's contact at grayparrot.ai um, there were quite a few um, I never managed to get around to, so I apologise um, for that. Um, but yeah, big thank you to everyone who joined us today, and uh, you'll be you'll be able to access the replay um, of the show on rwmexhibition.co.uk forward slash rwm. I've been digital. 
Um, so yeah, with that, we'll say goodbye and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.